Good afternoon. It's uh, Wednesday the 10th of February 2016, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host, Brian Gerrish. With me in the studio, deep behind the technical desk, is Mike Robinson. And we're going to be joined by live video Skype link by Alex Thompson from Eastern Approaches. Well, the weather, pretty gruesome in Plymouth. Grey, showers, cold. Um, yes, we'll leave it there. Sunny in Pembrokeshire, and understand it's a bit grey and overcast in Holland. Do we need to say more about the weather? If you find it depressing, it's the person up there trying to tell us that the EU is not a good thing. So when we get out of the EU, the UK column promises the weather will improve. Uh, well, is the press telling the truth? Do they need regulation? Um, lots of things starting to happen behind the scenes to do with control of the press. Mike? Uh, well, um, the argument about it is, seems to be pretty much in stalemate at the moment, but nonetheless, IPSO, which is the Independent Press Standards Organisation, um, has agreed uh, funding for the next four years. Um, so perhaps the, the deal is done for, for the next four years at least. Um, Sir Alan Moses, who's the chairman, has said that the uh, agreement uh, guarantees £2.8 million pounds a year uh, and will increase in line with inflation. Uh, and they um, are receiving this money via the body that they have uh, put together, uh, which is this one, the regulator f Regulatory Funding Company, um, which is uh, staffed by people drawn from the newspapers that have signed up to IPSO. Uh, and they pay for uh, its operation. And this is obviously following the Levison inquiry. Um, so there is a, a rival regulator, which is which many of the uh, sort of pro-hacking inquiry, common purpose type newspapers uh, are saying is backed by legislation. Um, and that's called Impress. Uh, but at this point in time, none of the uh, and UK newspapers have actually signed up to that. So they've also, well, most of them have signed up to Ipso. That's the one that seems to be in place for the next few years at least. So as I say, Brian, perhaps this is in the meantime um, a stalemate, perhaps is the best way to describe it. Well, it's, it seems that way to me, Mike. I'm going to be pretty bullish here and say that it was due to the efforts of the UK column and all our supporters who contributed to the knowledge um, that allowed us to expose what Leveson was doing and what um, Sir David Bell was doing with the Common Purpose Cabal. Um, still my view that the, the whole of the Leveson inquiry was an attempt at a, a state clampdown of the press and media here in Britain. And uh, if the Daily Mail in particular had not uh, run such an explosive um, expose of what Common Purpose was doing, I think we would already be in a situation of total state controlled press. And of course that would have been that would have made any any debate over the European Union referendum, for example, particularly difficult. And just in answer to those people who say, well, of course the press and media are completely controlled, I'm going to say I disagree. The control is over the editorial boards. And you can see that journalists, and many of them are, of course, self-employed journalists, are not giving in to the control and are also becoming more suspicious as that level of control comes in. So I believe that we've got to continue to work with journalists who show that they are still thinking and they are brave enough to speak out on hot topics. Perhaps we should uh, bring in Alex from the Netherlands and uh, just see what he thinks about the uh, Leveson effort to take control of the press. Alex, have we got you? You have, Mike, yes. Um, Leveson, it was only two and a half years after I emigrated to the Netherlands that Leveson held his hearings in 2012. And if I'm not wrong, he pr produced his report in 2013. But that was really a jaw-dropping moment for me. I was uh, in the kind of office in the Netherlands where you can plug your headphones in during the day, so I did and had a listen. And I could not recognise the 2012 Britain that would hold such a thing as this sham inquiry compared with even the 2009 Britain that I left. Uh, there had really been an incremental change in how the public authorities team together to attack the public institutions. So. Um, as as for uh, individual journalists telling the truth, I can recommend one name right now, which is Oliver Lane, 
He's on social media as Oliver J. J. Lane. Those are his middle initials. He writes, I think, on a freelance basis for Breitbart and has a particular focus on continental news. So he's a kind of equivalent of me. I uh, just got talking to him yesterday. A very solid chap. There are quite a few left, and a lot of them are under 40. OK, well, that, that is very good to hear. Well, having defended some journalists, I think it's time to give others um, quite a um, hard prod with a very sharp stick. And we'll start off with The Guardian. Now, a number of people flagged up this article. It's by a lady called Zoe Williams. And she said, how do we work out who to believe on child sex abuse? And uh, what people thought about this article was that uh, essentially she was trying to protect abusers. Now, I've spent a lot of time reading this article, and I think uh, there's something rather different going on. Uh, but these are some of the comments. Um, she is basically saying that um, it was a coincidence, but some ab abuse victims came to her. And when they started to tell her their stories, initially, she didn't b believe it. So this is one of the paragraphs. My first response was disbelief in the child abuse. Who would, have a ch who would have a child in order to sexually abuse it? What possible interruption of human instinct would have to occur for that to be possible? Yet my incredulity is driven by what I need to believe of other people, of the species. It has nothing to do with that woman or her case. Often the failure to hear these claims dis um, dispassionately has an element of group narcissism in which it's more important to maintain a collective delusion than it is to discover the truth. Now, I thought there was some substance in this because the lady is saying the story is essentially so horrible, you just don't want to go near it. You'd rather stay away from it. But then she goes on and says in 2013, when Keir Starmer was director of public prosecution, he revolutionised the way in which sex crimes were approached by asking a series of simple questions. Now, she listed those questions. I've cut them out in the excerpt here. But she lists the questions, but she doesn't give any answers to the questions. So it leads you into no man's land. And then she, she goes on. Uh, she says, what do we ask of victims before we will take them seriously? And to all those requirements, in the case of children, are we asking that the crime perpetrated against them should not be too grotesque before we consider its veracity? And if we're raising all these hurdles to justice, are we excluding those who deserve and need it? Both the accuser and the accused would be better served if we could reach some new normal in which our need to believe in human goodness uh, came second to the pursuit of justice. Now, I've highlighted this business of reaching some new normal because we've been pretty good at working out right and wrong and justice over many, many years. So what sort of new normal is she after? And I just wanted to add, add a bit, if I may there, Mike. Um, just take a look at some of these journalists who come out with these very vague articles. There's no proper research. There's no proper statement. This is a Twitter page. I took time out of my busy drinking schedule to rejoice in Justin Bieber. So what is the quality of this journalist? Is she trying to protect abusers? I don't think so. I think this woman is sitting in a fluffy bubble where she doesn't want to go near what the child uh, victims are saying because it's simply too uh, grotesque, as she says, and she can't handle it. So um, what do you do? You write a, a rather waffly piece on it. But if I come on to, so I'm going to say cognitive dissonance. She doesn't know where she is on this subject. But then look at the telegraph. And we've got here, no one is safe from prosecutors, terrifying incompetence on sex crimes. And this is a remarkable story, apparently about the gentleman ringed in the picture, uh, Mark Pearson, who was accused uh, of seriously sexually assaulting an actress who of course is unnamed um, on a uh, train or at a train station there was no evidence the video showed that he didn't do anything to her uh, but he was hauled through the the um, crown prosecution system so julia hartley brewers the um, journalist here and she says the cps has taken leave of its senses no longer Beyond all reasonable doubt, more and more people are now asking if the body charged with prosecuting offenders for their crimes is up to the job. And basically, she attacks the uh, CPS 
But if you read through this article, what she's actually doing is promoting that the CPS changes. So this apparently extraordinary case where an innocent man can be seen to be innocent from the video clip is attacked. Uh, she writes an article. The whole aim of the article is to promote change of the CPS. And what she doesn't go near is the CPS's own documents, uh, Crown Prosecution Service Improvement Plan. I'd just like to look at some of the language here because uh, here we are, the delivery of our long-term operating model enabled by streamlined digital processes together with inducing casework hubs to meet the challenges of our financial settlement. So this is about the privatization of the CPS. They want change. And I'm going to say that Telegraph article seems to be promoting it. The CPS um, determines which cases should be prosecuted, uh, prosecuted, prepares the charges, prepares the cases. And then down it goes in better engaging our people through strengthening leadership skills. This is uh, modern speak all about change of the CPS. Alex, what, what do you, or Mike, what do you see in this? Well, what I just wanted to say first, Brian, was that this, this tactic of undermining uh, investigations into child sexual abuse, where, of course, many of the allegations have been made against uh, high-level uh, members of the establishment, um, this is exactly the same tactic that they used with Operation Or. And if you remember, that list came over from the FBI uh, and uh, it contained many names on that list from members of the high-level British establishment. Um, and so what they then did was that they started um, to prosecute people that were clearly innocent. For example, I know of one case um, where a credit card was used to access a child pornography site, uh, but the credit card had been stolen and had been cancelled before it had to, they had attempted to use it on the child pornography site. So the person who had cancelled his card a year before ended up having his door kicked in and his computer taken away and all the rest of it eventually uh, found innocent, absolute, complete uh, miscarriage of justice all to undermine the entire investigation of Operation Or, and this is the same type of tactic that's going on here, isn't it? Exactly the same, and we can also add to, to that operation, uh, your comment on Operation Or, that of course several men committed suicide as a result of the hounding on them. So um, to dig into this, Alex, what, what do you see going on here? Are we digging too deep? No, I think you have to dig at that level, Brian, to find out what's going on with uh, a major public body. The DPP and the Crown Prosecution Service are quite a recent innovation in the law of England and Wales. And the CPS has had an inglorious history as an institution. For instance, there's Dame Barbara Mills. Uh, is it the sister-in-law or the actual sister, I think, of David Mills, husband of Tessa Jowell? Uh, if you go and look into Gordon Bowden's material, you'll see that... Uh, uh, Mills was investigated and uh, pronounced free of any wrongdoing in that Italian mafia money scandal while Mills was at the helm. Um, a number of things have happened with the CPS which are quite eye-watering. Uh, Starmer, for example, walked straight out of the uh, CPS job to become the Labour Member of Parliament for Holborn and St Pancras. Now, uh, some UK column viewers would say, oh, stop picking on Labour, but uh, the fact that he went to be an MP at all in a political sense, straight after being uh, the Director of Public Prosecutions raised his eyebrows, especially as he was named after Keir Hardy by his parents, the founder of Christian Socialism and, and uh, almost a Fabian style of thinking. I'm looking here also, and I've pasted it in the chat room, at a Daily Mail uh, report from July 2014 uh, entitled Stephen Fry Stuns Labour Gala with uh, Miliband present. Miliband was then the Labour Party leader and leader of the opposition. Uh, Fry, for reasons that will be clear to some of us, laid in to Keir Starmer, this is the current uh, DPP's pr uh, pr predecessor, for having uh, successfully prosecuted some pederasts under Operation Utree. And uh, I see here that uh, he went he, particularly for uh, Starmer and uh, tried to invoke Magna Carta against public prosecutions. Uh, ultimately, what this is all about, of course, is fusing Britain with the continent. Scotland's already halfway there, allegedly, with, with its mixed civil law, common law system. 
uh, that itself is an innovation. And I think that we're going to end up, as we've intimated in, in previous editions of the UK column, with this push by the great and good to have French-style privacy and German-style reporting that uh, John D has been prosecuted rather than John Doe 45, the, the, uh, the, the public holder of office or whatever. So there'll be anonymity throughout and, of course, the crucial plank is removing private prosecutions. If you don't understand why England and Wales is unique in Europe with its private prosecutions not having been uh, abolished by law that yet, then just go and look at the British Constitution Group's conference uh, videos from spring this year, and you'll see what kinds of injustice uh, private prosecution can overturn. OK, Alex, thank you for that. Well, I'm just going to add that if we got further into that document, the language, I think, is the giveaway. Here it is, what we do. This is the CPS mission. Uh, our mission is to deliver justice through independent and effective prosecution of crime, fostering a culture of excellence, supporting and inspiring each other to do the best we can. This is all the transformational language of an organisation that is no longer doing its job. It's uh, moving over the rainbow to the new utopia. And, and what's their priority is not to deliver justice. The number one here is to inspire our people. Um, well, it goes on, focus on quality. And we'll just remind you that this disgusting organisation was able to prosecute and continues to prosecute Melanie Shaw, child abuse victim. She gets no um, protection from Alison Saunders at all. Uh, it goes on and on and on. And what is Alison Saunders? Well, I believe she's a change agent. Um, this is another change agent, Lynn Homer. Lynn Homer destroyed every organisation she was placed in. Once she'd done it, she was uh, promoted. And we've got exactly the same thing happening with Alison Saunders. She's destroying the CPS from inside in order to bring in, Alex, as you said, a new form of justice in line with uh, France, Germany and the European Union. And where has this come from? Well, this is a glimpse going back into 2010. Here is the government saying that there's going to be a new approach to the whole of public services. This was the Total Place initiative, setting a new direction for public services and local authorities, putting the citizen at the heart of service design. That is the lie. What was going on here is things were being destroyed. 11 pilot schemes across the country and look at where it acted on 63 local authorities, 34 primary care trusts, 12 fire, 13 police and a wide range of third sector organisations. Never debated in Parliament, never discussed. And what was this designed to do? Well, this was to destroy the old before they could bring in the new, I'm going to say quasi European system. Would these people be that uh, devious? Well, let's just remind ourselves about uh, what the Conservatives seem to have been up to. So the report in The Guardian on the death of Conservative uh, chairman from Whitney, Christopher Shale, literally dead and buried. And that intrepid report talking about the role of David Cameron um, and other members of the Conservative Party with arms and nuclear weapons in South um, South Africa. Uh, well, they're capable of anything, um, certainly capable of destroying our economy, Mike. That's yes, all right, I'll let indeed. you take it on. Okay. Uh, right, uh, global trade. Um, we've been talking about the Baltic Dry Index for quite a long time now, uh, and uh, it continues to be in a completely collapsed state, so more record low prices for transporting uh, bulk dry uh, materials, coal, iron ore, these types of things. Um, and uh, so companies, uh, a, a number of companies have now suspended uh, payments to creditor, creditors because they um, are in such financial difficulties. Um, they, they're seeking to restructure. They're seeking to sell off bits and pieces. Uh, and so we're talking, what are we talking about? Uh, companies like Western Bulk, Norden, uh, Jinhu Shipping, uh, Mitsui OSK Lines, uh, Hyundai, Merchant Marine, and so on. Um, and uh, actually, um, if you remember the last time we discussed this, we were pointing out that uh, uh, the cost for uh, for um, hiring one of these ships, uh, for, for one of the biggest ships, the, cap the Cape size ch ships, uh, was falling around the two, three thousand dollars a day. 
Uh, well, actually, um, last Friday it was uh, around two thousand eight hundred dollars a day. Now we've since found out that it costs around eight thousand dollars a day to run these uh, ships. So that gives you an idea of the scale of the losses that some of these companies um, are uh, suffering. So in the meantime, uh, Maersk has come out uh, and made a statement on this, and they're basically saying that uh, the shipping companies are facing conditions which are significantly worse than 2008 at the end of the financial crash. Um, and uh, this is Niels Anderson from Maersk, and he's saying, he told the Financial Times, it's worse than it, is, it was in 2008. The oil price is as low as its lowest point in 2008, 2009, and has stayed there for a long time. Doesn't look like going up soon. Freight rates are lower. Uh, the external conditions are much worse, um, but Maersk claims that they are prepared. And that, of course, they're prepared because they've been laying people off and trying to make themselves more efficient and so on. Uh, he said that global trade conditions have been abnormal uh, and uh, that imports to Europe, Britain, Russia and West Africa in particular are all falling. Uh, and of course, the oil price is uh, is the, uh, the sort of main driver for this, according to him. Um, but Alex, uh, in desperation, it seems uh, they're sending ships into ports uh, which aren't really suited for them. Yes, um, shipping is one of those areas of life that is day-to-day -day interest to the to the average Dutchman. A bit like uh, cycle races; it's it's just uh, household talk in the Netherlands, and nobody in Britain's ever heard of it. So the whole country has followed this article or this this plight uh, of the I think it's the Chinese main shipping line has uh, got this mega vessel the Indian Ocean. It's got a whole range of them in this class, 20,000 TEUs, that's container equivalents. Um, the Indian Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, and Maersk, this Danish, I think it's now Swiss-based as well, even though Switzerland is not seafaring, This the, the Danish player is the only European player in the market, Maersk, and they have likewise got these mega uh, ships, totally unsuited to northern European estuary waters, but all the ports, uh, the to the extent that we have any British ports, they're all of that type, um, Flushing, Antwerp, which is down a narrow river channel the, the, of the Scheldt, uh, Hamburg, you have to sail up the Elbe, that's what happened here. These ships um, really are the only way of approaching an economic uh, operation from Asia to Europe because the crew to cargo ratio is lower. And the inevitable happens uh, on, on, when this Indian Ocean was doing its um, tour of European harbours and it ran on a sandbank and uh, Dutch specialist salvage units, uh, Smit, had to come from Rotterdam and even they took, I think it was three days and nights to try to shift it. Uh, they had to use the tide and, and uh, removing sand and all kinds of uh, uh, modalities. So the main point is it's not just an amusing story. There is no way that uh, shipping is economic in the current climate between Asia and Europe and really that is hugely bad news particularly for German exporters. I think we're going to see them turn vicious. Um, one so solution to this, of course, one you're keen on, Mike, is land bridges and strategic rail cargo to link Germany right through to its Asian markets overland. Britain could potentially benefit from that as well, but we're not investing in it. No. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll pause on that. Big ships and narrow channels, always a, a dangerous thing. So thank you for that one. Uh, well, if we change to another subject, which is war, which uh, many of our um, national and world leaders seem to be very uh, keen on, um, we've got the bizarre situation at the moment where the Americans have put climate change well into the uh, military budget. What is this about, Alex? It's about the capture of the Pentagon. And notice where it's come from. The Washington Times, uh, people not so familiar with the US media might think that this is an established old paper. It isn't. The Washington Post is the DC version of the New York Times, the liberal established paper. The Washington Times was set up in, I think, 1982 uh, by the Mooney Church, the Unification Church of the late uh, Sun Myung Moon. And so people don't tend to take it seriously because of that. But it's the only cult non-culturally Marxist newspaper among the, the US broadsheets. And it takes uh, this kind of isolated news uh, reporter to spot that the Pentagon has actually been captured at the equivalent of three, four star general level and certainly at headquarters at Pentagon by these change agents, to use a, a very suitable term for them, who are ordering soldiers to take account of the environmental impact of their military operations and indeed to uh, scrap their current plans for the potential invasion of any country and redraw them based on climate considerations. This seems to me to be uh, a ridiculous uh, 
subterfuge and, and uh, perhaps an undermining of national security considerations because countries that oughtn't be invaded can be bumped up the list through this uh, spurious mechanism of climate threats. Yeah. Well, if I can just uh, put my penny worth into that, um, Alex, of course, many people look at this and say it's ridiculous and it's nonsense and it's crazy. And, and I think we have to keep saying it's none of these and none of those things. Uh, basically, this is calculated policy in order to achieve uh, an ultimate objective. Capturing the military uh, is the term you've used, but it's also, of course, moving on to the agenda, uh, moving on the agenda towards the new global governance system. But Mike, um, uh, we've got a NATO task force uh, presumably working on climate change in Eastern Europe. Uh, well, perhaps, uh, but they seem to be uh, using the entire Royal Navy, um, if I'm about right. So you can comment on this, Brian. But uh, uh, RT uh, pointing out that uh, Royal Navy sending five additional warships to the uh, NATO Maritime Force uh, and uh, who are they sending? They're sending HMS Iron Duke, which is a Type 23 frigate. They're sending a tw Type 25 destroyer, which isn't identified. Three minesweepers, and uh, that's 530 naval personnel. Uh, we only have 540 naval personnel these days, isn't that right? Well, uh, roughly, but of course we've got a Type 45 in the foreground, and and we've just had reports in the... the uh, media that uh, these have got power problems they're getting power outages so they may be very advanced in some ways but they're not reliable so there's a nonsense going on here and of course minesweepers have a very important role but on a strategic scale deployment this is also nonsense um this, it's like watching a pantomime i think going on well um the ambassador to nato uh, this is sir adam thompson he described it as a more muscular approach to the one uh, sorry, a more, a more muscular approach than it has done since the Cold War to enhance its forward presence in the East and uh, as necessary to the South. Right. There you go. <laughs> okay, well, that's, uh, that's a good bit of new speak, transformational military change. Uh, but the French, of course, are going to be the driving force. Um, well, we've been talking about this for quite some time, the uh, merger of French and British uh, um, forces, um, and uh, we're hearing rumours about that, uh, including uh, nuclear arsenal. And I just wanted to highlight this article from the International Institute of Strategic Studies uh, from November 2010, where they're exact they're pushing exactly that policy. Britain and France's nuclear partners, and they're saying. Uh, uh, they're saying uh, in, in November 2010, as part of a broad ranging bilateral defence agreement, the United Nation Kingdom and France signed a treaty uh, providing for limited cooperation on nuclear weapons, modest in scope uh, and uh, the product in immediate terms of economic pressure. The nuclear treaty's main substantive prov provision is for the joint construction of a radiographic hydrodynamic facilities. Uh, beneath the surface of this treaty, however, lies uh, a story of significant strategic shifts and there are intriguing possibilities for the future collaboration between the UK and France and perhaps for trilateral cooperation involving the United States. Now, I know you've got a few things to say about past uh, the past views of the United States of France, um, but nonetheless, what this is saying that is part of that um, dirty deal that was done in, 2000, in May 2010 uh, to... Um, Bring Britain and this 50-year pact, Britain and between Britain and France, that in fact our nuclear arsenal uh, may have been part of that to some degree, and I think uh, there seem to be moves to move that forward now. Well, Mike, the UK column, we we've written a number of articles from many years ago saying that the objective was for the French to take over Britain's nuclear deterrent, Britain to be stripped of an independent nuclear deterrent, and that power, the power of nuclear weapons to be within Europe, principally by the French, but also by the Germans. And we're now seeing the truth starting to come to the, to the surface. So David Cameron, Blair and Brown, of course, previously, but David Cameron utterly lying to the nation about what the true agenda is. It's to uh, hand Britain's military to Europe, and we are to be stripped of um, independent nuclear deterrent. Alex, um, I'm sure you've got something to say on this one. Yes. Um Britain and France cannot be strategic nuclear partners because since the very early 1960s, we do not have the same arsenal 
as the French have. They still have their ICBMs, land-based ones, in the Massif Central. And de Gaulle took a deliberate decision uh, after being advised it would take five more years and cost billions of francs more than uh, cooperating with the US. He decided that no, France was going to be in NATO but not of it and design its own ICBMs. So if we pool our weapons, French ICBMs are never going to be moved out of their silos in the Massif Central, and we don't even have any RAF bombs anymore. All we have is the subs. The only way of pooling these resources is by moving British subs, perhaps prompted by Scottish independence shenanigans, out of Britain altogether to a shared base at Brest. Can you see any, any other way of pooling the resources when we stop talking woolly language and start talking about the actual mu nuclear assets that both country has? Well, of course, this, this, this is the whole thing, that um, those, uh, f the French force to frap can't be moved. Uh, so what we're going to do is dismantle Trident and, hey, presto, the French are being gi given control of, suppose, of our nuclear deterrent. Uh, just a bit of hypocrisy here, bringing Madeleine Moon, um, BBC News reporting that she's been uh, whinging, I think is the correct expression, that Labour hasn't been having an open and honest discussion about Trident. She said the policy of Labour is to get rid of Trident. There is no open discussion. So that all sounds good. Uh, what she actually said is to say that your position is that you're willing to discuss it, Trident, when clear you're not, is not honest. Well, we'd like to say to Madeleine Moon, isn't it strange that when you said you wanted to discuss the suicides amongst young children in South Wales, uh, you didn't want to discuss it because you refused to answer a single email or telephone call or respond to any articles about the suicides and possible causes. So sheer hypocrisy. Why should we trust this woman on uh, Trident? Well, we shouldn't, but dirty dealing going on in the background. Money is the cause of it, so perhaps we should bring in Mr Soros uh, on this one. Yes, uh, Soros is still not a household name to the Americans, and I covered last week that the Dutch are becoming aware that he is behind the drive to integrate Ukraine with the EU. And here we see, if you go to this, again, Washington Times, no one else will cover it. The art article is called George Soros Funds Ferguson Protests, for those listening in audio only. And the second half of the headline is that he hopes to spur civil action. Uh, that's a polite way of saying he hopes to get people out on the streets. I can't see any other way of uh, interpreting that. So Soros is investing ridiculous amounts of money in racial agitation. He is, in fact, the white counterpart of uh, these um, uh, you know, sham ministers who go around stirring the racial pot in America. Um, so open democracy, George Soros, fermenting revolution. And uh, if you look at organisations doing strange civil activities, we can very often track them back to Soros-related organisations. But what about this one, teaching Arabic at uh, lunchtime for children? This one is part of the feuilleton, which is the pull-out serious feature supplement of Germany's leading broadsheet, the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. And uh, the headline here is Arabisch als Pflichtfach tausend und eine Umnachtung. So uh, the idea is that Arabic is going to be made according to this uh, professor at a minor Hamburg university who's flying the kite for the idea. It's going to be made a compulsory subject at primary school. And he suggests even this guy, he's called Thomas Strotpotter, rather weird name, S-T-R-O-T-E-T-E. Oh, uh, Mr. Schrotthotter has suggested, apparently in his own uh, capacity as um, Chancellor of Kuna Logistics University in Hamburg, that in order to be linguistically neutral and to prepare these uh, little darlings for the future Germany, they're going to be taught Arabic as they play in kindergarten, and later on they're going to learn through English because he says it's a neutral language. It's neither German nor Middle Eastern. Um, if he's saying it out loud, a lot of other uh, German intellectuals, uh, post-national types, are thinking it. But the reactions uh, by readers on the FAZ uh, are quite encouraging. Even the FAZ itself uh, has uh, headers in the headline like um, uh, idiotic idea, um, impossible idea to implement. But we have a long history in Britain, too, of these so-called idiotic ideas being floated by one intellectual in a broadsheet, uh, being poo-pooed and then becoming government policy a few years later, don't we? Drifted in, nudged in. Uh, well, everything we see is uh, ramping up tension and hostility with uh, Russia. And you've picked up on the Baltic Times here uh, saying NATO's in for trouble. 
Yes, the Baltic Times is always a good one to go to because Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania have very open press cultures. They were repressed horribly by the Soviets and they don't believe in censorship. And they, they thought for a while they'd achieved the El Dorado of freedom and prosperity in joining the EU and NATO after 2004, 2005. But they're very disillusioned now, the masses of, uh, of people in each of these three countries. And so the Baltic Times reports here that NATO would lose, it's citing a report, NATO would lose against Russia in the event of an invasion of the Baltic states. Uh, small wonder, really, because just over the border from Estonia in Pskov, on the map here just behind me, you can actually see it within the borders of, almost within the frame of Estonia. Pskov plays headquarters to a whole army division. Uh, Estonia would be flattened. It would take, uh, according to this report, something like 24 to 48 hours to fight their way all the way over to the coastal capitals, uh, Tallinn and Riga. Uh, these countries are the size of Yorkshire something of that nature. Bear in mind when we hear about Article 5 pledges to defend NATO members, uh, that much as I love these countries and, and what, what a wonderful history they have standing against the Russians and the Germans, uh, they are, in the case of Estonia, a million people. Yes, they'll fight to the death for them on their own accounts, but uh, we would see r ridiculous amounts of losses if we had anything to do with them as allies. And in that light, I'm very shocked that European defence ministers, I don't know if it's in an EU or a NATO format, are meeting today, I think in Brussels, to discuss putting ground forces on a permanent stationed basis in the Baltic countries. Well, of course, um, I, I think what we're seeing, um, particularly from Mr uh, Cameron and Mr Fallon at the moment, is pure propaganda. Uh, we're ramping up... Um, uh, the call for war against Russia, because that is what it is. But in the background, we've got this going on. So we just remind people again, uh, we've got David Cameron scrapping HMS Ocean. So just had a £65 million um, refit. Um, re big ship, um, commando carrier, important vessel, biggest vessel in the Royal Navy at the moment, but it is going to be scrapped. And this was all done very quietly. It wasn't put in David Cameron's defence review. It was slipped out in the House of Lords uh, by Earl Howe. So David Cameron is absolutely lying to the British public. He's winding up the fear of conflict against Russia. Of course, he's using American troops. It's all to do with the power of America, while David Cameron is destroying Britain's military and, and handing it to the French. Um, inset picture is of uh, Cameron on board one of the Trident uh, submarines. So treason in front of our eyes, and the plan is that we have no nuclear deterrent. It's to be handed uh, to the French. Um, so that probably leads us in quite nicely to um, ISIS. Yes, America's ISIS war is uh, helping Al-Qaeda, is the headline in the Daily Beast. And that might seem quite a shocker of a headline, and you might think, oh, Daily Beast is just uh, stirring the pot. But if you actually go to the briefing linked in this article uh, from the U.S. Department of Defense, you see a full transcript of what the journalist asked Lieutenant General Sean McFarland. One has to say Lieutenant General in the American pronunciation if, uh, for him, um, although we would otherwise say Lieutenant. Now, here we are uh, in the middle of this piece. He is uh, asked by someone, what is the actual uh, effect of the um, U.S. Um, uh, here we are, it's, it's Nancy Youssef with the Daily Beast, and the, the question she asks uh, General McFarland is, one of the things we've seen particularly in Syria is that the US-led strikes have benefited al-Nusra Front, some, uh, an organisation known to Brian and Mike, I'm sure you'll comment in a moment. And so, says the journalist with the Daily Beast, I'm curious if you could give us your assessment of al-Qaeda's current standing, particularly in Syria. Then she has another paragraph of question. General McFarland replies, yeah, I don't believe that any of the strikes we're doing are benefiting al-Nusra Front. I mean, that's the last thing that we want to do. Next paragraph. Now, al-Nusra Front and ISIL slash Daesh, he doesn't know what to call it, don't get along. That's his claim. So, I guess you could say that to the extent we're weakening Daesh, maybe it benefits al-Nusra Front. What do you make of that admission by General McFarland, Brian? Uh, well, I'm going to say I'm slightly bemused because, of course, um, we haven't got any real definition of who these various groups are. They've got labels and names, but are they different? Um, one minute we're supposed to be helping some of them, one minute we're not. So I'm going to say on air, I don't know. You tell me. Well, I think the clue is uh, a certain uh, MP Brooks Newmark. 
didn't he go and spend two days on the Turkish Syrian border uh, chumming up al Nusra? Oh, well, he did. It was um, um, he was with uh, the Syrian free uh, Syrian free army in the first place, but of course he was boasting of their strong links with al Nusra. And that ultimately led to him apologising to the Syrian Free Army that British bombs and rockets were not raining down on Assad. So it so, looks like we have a transatlantic neocon, for want of a better word, agreement that Al Nusra are the right kind of Islamist radicals. Doesn't it seem so? I, I would say so. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the black humour's coming in. We better move on here. So um, we've got Chechen spies infiltrating Islamic State. This is another jab at Moscow, I presume, is it? It is, because uh, what the West can't stand is that the man who said it, Ramzan Kadir Kadyrov, uh, was actually brought over from uh, being uh, a rebel against Russian authority in that first Chechen war of the mid-90s to being now president of the uh, Republic of Chechnya within the Russian, Russian Federation and a Putin loyalist. So we get all this dross about um, his pet tigers and what a strong man he is, and as if Chechnya was ever going to be any different culturally, as if it was any different before him. Uh, no, it's, it's always been ruled by men like that. That's their, their culture. But there he is saying, uh, we are actually allegedly saying, and uh, he may have been spun, but he's saying we have infiltrated ISIS with Chechen spies who are actually going to report back to Russian uh, special forces who will then uh, rein in strikes on them. So it's an indication of how complicated this picture is. Uh, Chechnya, uh, as, as a rebel, source of rebellion against Russia, was actually provoked by the West. Even that little uh, country of Estonia on that map behind me, one of my favourite countries, uh, actually gave them a head start in their rebellion about, against Russia in that uh, Estonian ex-special forces dropped uh, quite a lot of supplies to these Chechens, uh, international terrorists to use, to use the, the press phrase, uh, they dropped these supplies out of planes at the beginning of the war uh, in recognition of the fact that Jokhar Dudayev, uh, a Chechen by ethnicity, had been the commander of Soviet's riot forces in Estonia during the breakup of the USSR and had ordered his men not to open fire and allow them to have a peaceful revolution against the Soviets. So there's all kinds of murky stuff going on really. In fact, uh, people tend to forget it now, but even back in ninety four there was uh, a, a chap discovered, I think cut up in pieces in the boot of a car in, in Manchester, who turned out to be a special envoy of this rebel force, rebel entity of Chechnya when nobody had heard of it. And he was trying to interest British philatelists in rare stamps issued by the new Republic of Chechnya, rebelling against Russia. Uh, all these are little indications to me that somebody had a hand in the Chechen rebellion, that it was not an autonomous rebellion, and that to this day a significant part of these Chechen rebels, I think, are actually being funded from the West. So being funded from the West, at the same time, of course, the, the fear factor is being used to ramp up the European army and European integration. I'll just quickly flash this one on screen. Very interesting article from Liam Fox, um, who's really hammering the EU and he says it's time to end the spectacle of a British Prime Minister with a begging bowl. There's only one answer to give, take control, vote, leave. So that's pretty um, that's pretty in your face from Liam Fox. Not sure what his agenda is. Um, but uh, you've got a number of um, comments here on other things going on to do with EU reform. Yes, it's a good idea to plug uh, individual uh, tweeters who are uh, asking the right questions. And here down in uh, the southwest, very near you, is a tweeter called Cornish View. That's his Twitter handle or hers. I think it's a he. And uh, he has retweeted via Roger Helmer of UKIP the fact that Barroso, the former uh, president of the European Commission, has said you can do what you like with reforming the EU. It will not deter migrants on their way to Britain. How does Barroso know this? And Cornish View has correctly inter inter uh, noted here that Barroso used to belong to the Maoist movement. So he may still have uh, radical Marxist Maoist ideas. Uh, there's no indication that uh, he's, he's actually lost them, I think. So is, is this a, a, a veiled threat? Is he saying that he has inside knowledge that waves of people are going to be thrown at the cliffs of Dover, whatever we do with the EU? Mm. Well, I think we've had a few Maoists in uh, power in Westminster, but what about the Lord's um, EU Select Committee? Yes, uh, here we have in the middle there the lady is of my profession. She's a conference interpreter, and she is interpreting for the gentleman to her left and right. These are uh, German MPs, one representing each of the old uh, Deadwood political parties, Detlef Seif and Axel Schaefer. 
Uh, they've both had uh, European Parliament's experience. And I listened to, uh, live yesterday afternoon because it's very rare to have continental MPs turn up in committee rooms. Uh, it does happen sometimes, and you have the mayor of Calais appearing to the Commons Home Affairs Committee, but now it's the Lords EU Committee yesterday afternoon. And uh, one of them, I think it was Mr. Seif, said, uh, we have a bit of a problem here because you invited us to talk about the spectrum of German political views on the forthcoming uh, EUK referendum on the EU. And he said, our problem is that with 650 people in the Bundestag, the German par parliament, we could not find one who believed that the UK would be better off leaving the European Union. Now, I don't think he's lying. I think he's saying that the German establishment is such a closed shop that there are, out of our 650 MPs, not, and some of them actually represent fringe parties, not just the CDU and the and socialists, not one of these MPs could be prepared to say, I believe that Britain should exercise its national sovereignty. And during the course of their exchanges, uh, Seif and Schaefer actually said, in terms, uh, our problem is that you in Britain put sovereignty first, historically at least, and we in Germany decided, or, or had it imposed upon us in 48-49, when we wrote our new constitution, that we would never again go to war with anyone, and therefore the German constitution forces us not to put national sovereignty first. Now, that's a very frank admission of why we can't mix the UK and the continent. It's chalk and cheese. Okay, right. Well, before we uh, finish on matters financial, just give us a brief comment on this um, issue with, po I think this is to do with Poland, transition reversible. Yes, uh, the, the Legatum Institute, uh, a Latin name, it means either a legate or a tie or a bond. Uh, Legatum Institute is asking this rather waspish question, is transition reversible, question mark, the case of Central Europe? And this uh, chap, uh, Anton Shekhovtsov, uh, a Russian writing for the Legatum Institute is basically saying uh, nasty Poland, nasty Hungary, how dare they put, again what we were talking about, how dare they put the national interest first, how dare they still believe in sovereignty one now that they've joined the, U the EU project. Um, I'd be very interested if any viewers can find out where the Legatum Inst Institute gets its funding from. Uh, I've got a fair suspicion that their main funder may be a gentleman whose uh, surname begins and ends with the letter S. <laughs> Um, I'm going to guess Mr. Soros. We'll do some work on that for you. OK, Alex, thank you very much for your analysis, as always. Um, Mike, just uh, let's end with a look at uh, what's happening with the international banks. And, of course, m many of these organisations are funding the drive for yet more war. Well, hot on the heels of Deutsche Bank, Credit Suisse has had to make a similar statement. If you remember, Deutsche Bank had to tell us that everything was all right yesterday uh, or the day before. So um, their statement is quite similar to Deutsche Bank's with their chief executive saying everything's all right. It's all OK. Honest Gov. Uh, and uh, Credit Suisse, Suisse uh, now worth 20 percent less than it was a week ago on the stock market uh, and 50 percent less than it was uh, back in July when uh, the new chief executive took over. He said the banking system in general is much stronger than in 2008, 2009, uh, but there are a lot of memories of that period. Some of the scenes we're seeing today are not justified. And that's what he was whining about. Banks are smaller, apparently. They're deleveraged, apparently. Uh, they are less risky, apparently, and they're better capitalized. So he's clearly, like many bankers, quite willing to lie through his teeth. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, UBS also in trouble, and they've decided that they need to uh, put a halt on any salary rises this year. Uh, they um, have 5,200 people working in their inv investment bank division, uh, and they had expected uh, pay increases, uh, and uh, well, they're not going to get them. So several so similar to several other banks uh, in the same sort of peer group, uh, they've been hit by what are being described as trading conditions which are treacherous. Um, well, Alex, there's no need to panic, though, is there? Well, uh, the British press, mainstream press, is not telling us anything about this, as far as I can see. Correct me if I'm wrong, because I don't see everything over here. Uh, but I see that the uh, Parisian Stock Exchange, the CAC, uh, as uh, approaching that psychologically crucial 4,000 points. And as well as being on the website of Les Echos, the French business paper, this was emailed through to subscribers, including me, with a French tongue-in-cheek remark. It's not quite time to panic yet. Okay, we'll get ready to we'll get ready to panic. Well, no, we won't because we're we're going to stay 
calm on this issue because what the government wants is fear and panic and confusion at every level. Um, I think we're going to say what we all need to do is cold, calculated analysis. Yes, and uh, it would help if we actually had a forum in the mainstream press to talk about these things. People have heard of websites like zerohedge.com. Uh, Mike uses a plethora of uh, sources, having worked in finance before, to get his information. But perhaps Mike can just chip in with uh, a pointer to where people can get this analysis. Uh, no, it's it's a bit tricky, Alex, because uh, there are a lot of different sources, but um, it's it's either so dumbed down as to be useless or rather technical, which most people won't be interested in. So it's difficult to get, it is actually difficult to get a sort of middle ground there. I think we're going to, we will say the UK column will continue to do its best to provide a middle of the road analysis. Um, well, we've, we've squeezed in uh, or we've gained a little bit of time. So we're just squeezing another subject. You've got the Pete Zwart Institute here, uh, which I think is going to lead us on to liquid logic. Yes, I, I uh, looked into Liquid Logic when you featured it yesterday, Brian, and you said, what on earth is this? I hadn't heard of it either, really. I think I, vaguely once. And as usual, the Dutch come up trumps because when they hear something, they talk about it openly because they, they don't realise that in the English-speaking world you're supposed to keep things secret. Uh, so uh, bless them, they, 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 they shout it from the rooftops. And here we have the Pete Zwart Institute. They seem to be into contemporary art and education and all kinds of things, saying in the first paragraph, uh, if you just Google... Um, Pete Zwart, you'll find it. Here we are, thank you. Uh, they say in the first paragraph, since the 19th century, the political and artistic avant-garde have been thinking about the role of art in education in relation to, here comes the crunch, societal circumstances and change, predominantly with the goal of emancipation. That's a, another word for Marxist liberation and revolution. And at the end of the paragraph, you read the lectures and seminars are constructed around the idea of liquid logic, which is defined as a more open, networked and fluid way of approaching the otherwise structured and compartmentalized educational models. Wow. Uh, logic it ain't. Uh, well, I, I honestly get a creepy feeling from uh, seeing that on screen because you, you get the impression of persons unknown um, collaborating in order to bring in this change agenda. And for anybody who didn't pick up on our comment yesterday about liquid logic, this was um, picked up as part of Liverpool City Council's MAPA multi-agency uh, multi public protection arrangement and their MASH cells, uh, which is a huge network of people spying on the public, people supposedly who need help, but li liquid logic was the database. Well, as a result of that article, we got this in from uh, an informed viewer. Um, in fact, somebody uh, who is very closely connected with the DWP. And they said the Department of Work and Pensions is a partner to the team you mentioned. This is the MAPA MASH cells. And all frontline staff have a procedure to follow for referral to that said team um, if someone's deemed suicidal or at risk. Mental health training and NLP courses are currently being offered. All the financial information regarding income and assets is gathered and shared with the multi-agencies. I think the sanction-driven agenda will help put the general public under sufficient stress. In a nutshell, what the person is saying there is that we, we talked about social services, housing, uh, the NHS, but you should also include DWP, and if you get caught up in that network, all of your financial information, etc., will be um, will be revealed amongst all those networked agencies. And the database system they're using is Liquid Logic. Alex, I've got to be tough here. Um, Thirty seconds on your book, and uh, we must end today's news. This double bill, they're both available as PDFs, but Tragedy and Hope, uh, which is Carol Quigley's definitive work, is better or, uh, ordered as a um, cheap ebook via Amazon Kindle or, uh, or others, whereas the other one, the Anglo-American establishment, is only available as a PDF, but it is free and it's uh, easily readable, including on devices because it's, uh, it's big type. The point about this is we get a lot of flack from people saying, stop going on about Nazi plots. Uh, point taken. The Nazis aren't around anymore, at least not openly. They might not have done everything they're claimed to have done. And uh, in order to balance the picture, I would urge people to read this genuine conspiracy, which called itself a conspiracy, 
uh, which started in late 19th century London and eventually spread out to encompass Washington, New York and the rape and pillage of Southern Africa. Okay, well, we're always encouraging people to do their own research and, and books such as this, very important to beginning to build the, the picture. I'll simply add to that that whatever the global conspiracy is, the real danger is what is taking place at a local level. It will be your local NHS that comes with the psychiatric team. It will be your local police. So if you want to stop what's happening, we've got to be prepared to expose it and block it at a local level. Alex, thank you very much for joining us. I hope the sun has now appeared in the lowlands of Holland. Uh, we look forward to having you back again. Um, thank everybody else for joining us uh, today. We will be back at the same time tomorrow. Bye-bye. <laughs>